Okay. So, did everybody have a good spring break? Did anybody go anyplace fun? Colorado. You went to Colorado. What did you do in Colorado? Go skiing? No, I don't do that. <laughs> so why the hell would you go to Colorado? My brother lives there. Okay, so you got to go and see your brother. What did you do besides skiing? Like, you go skiing? Went to breweries and partook in something that's legal there. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you should be interested to know that uh, the Supreme Court has denied Oklahoma uh, hearing in the case against Colorado. Nebraska and Oklahoma filed lawsuits against the, the state of Colorado for their legalization of marijuana based on the idea that it was having an impact on our state because yeah. people go to Colorado, buy it, and come across the border, and of course they're saying that that's impacting the crime and the enforcement of it against state lines. It is still a Schedule One narcotic on the uh, federal uh, narcotic thing, and so it's it's controlled dangerous substance, and they were arguing that federal law trumps. The interesting thing is that the Obama administration, in that case, said what? We don't we don't care. We're not gonna we're not gonna side with Oklahoma and Nebraska, so we're not gonna try and enforce basically federal law. I don't know if that's good or bad. What do you all think will happen in, in terms of marijuana? It definitely it made an impact there because I could tell when I because the first thing they do is look at your ID and they saw us from out of state and here. So you can only get uh, you can only buy a certain amount and they tax the hell out of you uh -huh. for being from out of state. So it's a big revenue generator there. Yeah. So what can you buy in terms of the amount? I think for most you're allowed to buy is an ounce if you're from out of state. Okay. So, but there's like 50 dispensaries, so you can just go to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and you can end up with a whole bunch. Do you think it'll be legal in the next 10 years? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Even in Oklahoma? Do you think it'll be taken off? Bernie Sanders said last night on one of the things, the, the candidate forum thing, that he was for the um, removal of marijuana from the the Controlled Dangerous Substance Act. Do you think that's going to happen? I don't know. It's difficult to get stuff like that through Congress. Why? You have to have at least 60 votes in the Senate. There are how many senators? There's 100. Two from each state. We have 50 states. In order to break a filibuster, which you'd probably get, you'd have to, in order to get a vote of cloture, you'd have to have 60 senators agree, and I'm not sure you could get 60 senators to move aside for that vote. So I'm not sure how long it'll be. I think that in most states it will probably, at least for medical uses, be legal in the next 10 years. But I think more and more states are going to. Oklahoma did legalize one part of it. They did, but it cannot be the yeah, zero THC. Yeah, and it's just for cancer stuff, and it's a I think it's a pill form, and it's got no THC in it. Which I I think most of the studies suggest that that's the most effective part of the drug in terms of controlling the nausea for. Uh, it's, a, it's called cancer. like CBP or something. There's another form of it that's for pain, mm -hmm. and that's the part that they. Yeah. One of the things that's become very problematic in recent history with this is the synthetic marijuana, which has none of the characteristics, really, of marijuana. And it has really bad effects. One of the things that they've said with regard to most studies on marijuana is that the levels of violence are very low among marijuana users compared to, say, alcohol or other drugs. That's not true with the synthetic, and so that is somewhat problematic. Anybody else going anywhere? I went to Paris. You went to Paris on the study tour? How was that? Exhaustive. It was exhausting? <laughs> yes. I think you mean exhausting. When you say exhaustive, that well, means it covers it all. We covered a lot, though, because he had three things scheduled, four things scheduled every single day from like 8 a.m. to midnight. Um, from 8 a.m. to midnight? For seven days. So it was rather exhaustive. Yes. Okay, so and exhausting. Yes. <laughs> all right. Very good. Any place else? Yes. I was weather from Texas.
Oh, well, that's fun. Good. All right. So, if you have anybody else go anywhere? How was that? <laughs> what did you do in Gulf Shores? Just a spring break trip? Yeah. The and first, why was it crazy? The first two weeks, they made 700 arrests. 80% were under age three. Okay. <laughs> I can believe that. First time we were in our hotel, we had probably a group of like 70 people would go, and like 20 of them got arrested. <laughs> Were they underage drinkers? Yeah. Maybe I should have been there to pass out my phone. And then they have to, in Gulf Shores, they have to stay in jail for 12 hours once they're booked. And it took like five hours for them to get booked. So they were in jail for 17 hours. Wow. So their vacation was booked. <coughs> Mine was fine. I was still had fun the next day. They didn't book. Okay. Who else went to Where'd you go? LA. How was that? And what'd you go to LA for? Just for work. For work? So it wasn't completely <laughs> fun. Yeah. <laughs> What's what was the work that you're doing there? Uh, at my I work at Daniel Shoes and we sell Brighton uh, jewelry and purses and stuff, and so oh. I went to their factory. So you were buying? What? You were buying? No, it's like to learn more about the company. And okay. So it was partly fun. Though. Yeah, it, it was fun. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Yeah. The reason I ask you this is how many of you are going to be here next year, through next year? All right, so I'm going to give you a sales pitch for those of you who are going to be here through next year. I went to New Orleans, uh, Louisiana for spring break. I go almost every year at spring break. It seems that that's the time that the American Marketing Association's International Collegiate Conference is. And so we are looking, almost all of our officers this year are uh, going to be graduating in May, so we're recruiting for next year's AMA group. We have a highly competitive chapter. The school pays for everything. You went to Paris, the school gave you $1,000. There was two scholarships. There was two scholarships, so you got two scholarships, and it still cost you what? With the $1,500. Okay, I'm not going to disparage that because I think that's a worthy goal and you should try it, but this is a totally paid for trip if you join AMA. Become an officer, we compete in a number of things. We have a sales competition at AMA, and I can tell you that it's one where our sales students really have the opportunity, I think, to rock because we have a much better sales program than a lot of the schools that compete at that one. The AMA competition and the AMA membership and that trip are totally controlled pretty much by me. I don't have to go to the rest of the faculty and try to get them to agree to my choice, which we do with the sales team. And so if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to join AMA. You can join AMA very easily by going to ama.org. And for students, it's really a very affordable, it's a really very affordable membership. Um, and one of the benefits of joining is that you can put it on your resume. I don't know why you wouldn't want to join the professional organization because you all are for the most part, going to be professional marketers when you get out of here. And so I don't know why you would want to join the professional organization, which will help you network. Most of what you will do and the success you will have will be determined by who you know. And networking is an enormously important part of that. And this is an opportunity. They have a career fair at the AMA uh, International Collegiate Conference, and so you can work with uh, other students, you can go to the career fair. We compete in chapter plan, chapter report, chapter communication, and community development. Jonathan Carter, one of our sales students, placed five out of 200 in the mini sales competition called Perfect Pitch, which is a speed selling competition. We also have a speed selling competition at RBI, which he won fourth place at that, but there were far fewer competitors at that conference that he went to. There were 200 that signed up, and he, he came in fifth. And that's pretty indicative of the kinds of results that we get last year at AMA. We didn't this year, but last year we won in four, three categories, chapter plan, chapter report, chapter communication, based on, on that so you get awards. And that's good to put on your resume, I think. You can just click join AMA, and for students, it's like, I think, around $50 to join. And you'd select the UCO chapter. And then uh, it, would, it would tell us that you're enrolled. And if you join, I'll put you in touch with Jonathan. 
we're going to be holding, I think, officer elections pretty quickly. So what we do is we pay for your airfare, your hotel, and an $80 a day per diem for food for you. So that's not bad. Plus, we have a small um, entertainment budget that we get to use uh, during the conference. We go the day before the conference to New Orleans, so we have some time there to do things like go on a river cruise. We were going to do a swamp tour this year, but the swamps are all flooded, and so the tours were canceled. So we went on the Natchez River Cruise, went down to see a Civil War battlefield, had lunch, that was kind of entertaining. We also went to the aquarium, the school paid for that, so it's a good opportunity. You've invested a lot of your money here with us, and this is our opportunity to give something back to you and invest in you and provide that kind of experience. So it's really an incredible experience and you really ought to consider it. If you're interested, please join, send me an email, and I will you know, get you with Jonathan because we're going to be developing our officers for the next act that here so we can do our chapter plan and chapter report and meet again. So I think it's something that you should seriously consider. Like I said, it's not a big investment. For me, as a professional, I think it's $350 a year that I have to pay as a, as a professional to join AMA. And there are all of these resources out there for you. So it's a really good, good deal, good way to network. Also, by joining that, you have access to the Oklahoma City Chapter. They have lunches once a month for the Oklahoma City Chapter, and that is another awesome opportunity for you to go and network with local professionals here that are probably going to be able to help you and get a job. And so I strongly encourage you to do that. All right. So there I've given you my shameless plug and my sales pitch for joining AMA and why you should do it. You should become involved. I know that's sometimes difficult here at a commuter school because people have other things. They've got to go, you know, work and have families. And so it's, uh, it's a stretch. But really, it is a good opportunity for you if you can afford to do it and, and invest some time. I think it, it'll pay off dividends many, many, many times over. Last Thursday, I apologize for not being here, my presentation was supposed to be on Friday at the Association of Collegiate Marketing Educators, and Dr. Gooch was one of the presenters on another paper that we had submitted, and Dr. Jinchev was on that paper as well, and they moved, well, Dr. Gooch couldn't go because he's in Houston with his wife, and Dr. Jinchev had something else to do, and then the association called me and said, can you be a uh, session chair, and we've had a session chair who couldn't make it, and so I had to quickly scramble and try to find someone to cover my classes, so I got my mother. <laughs> you said she did nothing to talk about me. I'm sorry if, if that's what happened. She is a very <coughs> proud parent. I, I know that. I think she's a very stereotypical Southern mother. She likes her boys, and she talks a lot about us, so I, I hope she didn't bore you too much with those details, but I was grateful that she was able to come in and get it. I did get your recordings up from that day already, so you can see yourself. And I take it she made you, it looks like, stand up in front of the class, yeah. and, rather than sit at your desk. Was that a horrific experience? It wasn't terrible. It wasn't, it wasn't terrible? Okay. All right. So we need to talk about the meaning and value of work today, and we'll talk about employee rights and then employee responsibilities. And I think one of the things that makes marketing interesting and one of the things that I told you at the beginning that you should know and should come tripping off your tongue by the end of any class with me is that marketing is the what? Only fully, Only fully integrated function of the firm. What does that mean? Well, it means that marketing is the one that deals with both internal and external environments. So when we talk about marketing, we talk about the sort analysis, strengths, Weaknesses, those are internal to the company, opportunities and threats are external, and marketers have to work with all of those. We seek to ensure that all aspects of the firm are creating value for the firm and for our customers and constituents. So I think one of the things that marketing does, and one of the reasons that I liked marketing as a discipline when I decided to get my PhD is because I sort of like this idea of the liberal arts. And I've told you all before that and I started out as a liberal arts major. I started out as a classical letters major and political science major because that was the best majors to get to go to law school. And that kind of major really is about forming a well-rounded individual and <coughs> exposing you to a wide variety of thinking and thoughts and ideas and cultures and languages. And 
that's very similar to marketing. Marketing is what I call the liberal arts of the business college because we are the ones who think about things like art and aesthetics in terms of advertising and promotion. It is very much an art form, but it is also a science in that we can study consumer behavior. One of the things that I did on this trip to New Orleans this year was one of the students wanted to eat it. There's a place called Acme Oyster in the quarter. We stay right on Canal Street at the Sheridan every year, which is three blocks from the quarter, five blocks from Bourbon Street, which can be somewhat interesting with six graduating seniors in New Orleans over spring break. So she wanted to eat at the Acme Oyster Company, which is sort of a famous place. And the one in the quarter, there is always a line out the door and around the block to get into it. It's one block between Bourbon and Royal, and it's enormously popular. Well, I found they have another location, and it's in the casino. And so I said, we're going to go to the casino, and I have to justify it by taking them to the casino by making a marketing pitch. And the casino is one of those areas where you can see marketing science actually in, in, in action. And it's enormously successful, we know based on the research in the gaming industry from marketers, exactly what are the most efficient ways and effective ways of getting people to come into the casino and stay for long periods of time. And they've done lots of studies on this. Everything from the pattern on the carpeting and the colors that are used to the design of the casino is made to entice you. And we know an enormous amount about that as a result of watching studies. And one of the things that they do in these kinds of studies that we can't do or maybe we'd have a harder time doing because we have something called the Institutional Research Board or the Institutional Review Board is they look at the cameras and watch what people are doing. And that's how these study because all of the casinos have lots and lots and lots of cameras, right? And figuring these things out. And so they have an enormously rich amount of data that they can look at. And they, they do things like we know that they not have in casinos that keep people in there longer that will cause you to lose track of time. There are no windows, no clocks in the casino. Right? The colors are inviting. The sounds that they use on the machines are all designed. And that ching 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 to, to get you excited about the games. And it's enormously successful at doing that. And so that's sort of the hard science part of marketing. And I point all of this out because when we talk about these chapters, a lot of students ask why I cover these chapters in a marketing book. And I think it's because we have to recognize as marketers that there is also internal marketing that we go about. And so this idea of studying the meaning and value of work in marketing is, I think, important because one of the things that we are now looking at with regard to the most successful companies are ones that engage in something called living the brand. And so you have to integrate this idea of branding with HR and focus on the internal marketing to those internal constituents in order to get people to come. So the text talks about, and one of the things that we know from studies are things like an organizational behavior. One of the the founding thinkers in organizational behavior studies was a sociologist named Max Weber who talked about the bureaucracy and the idea that the bureaucracy was the ideal form of organization. So Weber looks at, and this was picked up by the way by the American political scientist Woodrow Wilson who was the only president, anybody know what Woodrow Wilson did before he was president of the United States? What is Woodrow Wilson's distinction as president? What's the deal? We've had lots of lawyers that were presidents. Bill Clinton was a lawyer. Barack Obama's a lawyer. George W. Bush wasn't smart enough to be a lawyer. We've had lots of lawyers. What was Wilson's distinction. He was a political scientist. He had a PhD in political science. He was the, the president of Princeton. And he looks at this and he's oftentimes called the father of 
American public administration. And Weber is a sociologist who says that the bureaucracy is the ideal form of government. Now, what do we think of when we think of a bureaucracy? Well, we think of a pyramidal structure, right? Where at the top, you have the chief executive officer, or we, that's what we call it in business, the chief executive officer. And we've now started using these terms in public administration. So city managers are the chief executive officer for the city, usually the mayor. Now, in this council manager form of government, sort of a titular figurehead who is the president of the council. So you have the chief executive officer. Under that, you have uh, various levels until you get down to the lower <coughs> levels, and you have these sort of street-level bureaucrats. The scientific management is also picked up by Taylor, looking at studies. And so Weber says <coughs> that this sort of structure is the ideal form of efficiency. Because these individual boxes represent jurisdictional areas or specialization. And because of the specialization, they are able to function efficiently. And he viewed people very much as cogs in a machine. And if the cog isn't working, what can you do? It's sort of like cars today. What do they do if your car is having a problem? They don't actually, you don't have very many mechanics anymore, really. They have auto technicians. When I was growing up as a kid, there were actually people who would rebuild transmissions. There were lots of transmission shops in every little town. Have you seen a transmission shop in the last 15, 20 years? Does anybody actually rebuild transmissions? What kind of car? <coughs> okay. Lots of transmissions now are closed systems. So if the transmission goes out, they can't fix it. What are they? Okay. What do they do? Well, I'm under warranty. Okay. Yeah, they just plug. They just pulled the part out, mm -hmm. threw it away, and put a new one in. Mm -hmm. And you now actually have to have the transmission rebuilt. They actually could rebuild it. Yeah. Okay. A lot of places, a lot of transmission shops have gone out of business because well, like it is just name. plug and play. They used to do this a lot. There used to be in Guthrie, my hometown, there used to be something like five transmission shops in town. There's none. We have some service centers that you can go to, and again, what they'll do is they'll hook your computer, they'll hook your car up to a diagnostic. It'll tell them what's wrong based on the computer codes that are spit out, and then they'll pull the part out and throw it away and replace it with a new one. That's what Weber said. If the cog is not working, you can pull this out and replace it with something else. So Weber says that these structures, these bureaucracies, have three characteristics that make them highly efficient, and that are the ideal form of organization. First of all, he said that they have a hierarchy. So it goes, you know, more people at the bottom up to the top, and you have one person at the top, this CEO. In American politics, that one person at the top is who? The head of government is the what? The president. Under the president, you have departments, the Department of State, the Department of Defense, the Department, so, and then you have under him, so you'll have these secretaries. In an organization, we would call these not secretaries, but what? You'd have vice presidents. So you have a vice president of uh, finance. You have a vice president of marketing. You have a vice president of operations, the chief operating officer, chief marketing officer, the chief financial officer. Under them, you have what? Directors. So there's in accounting departments, you a lot of times will have a director of accounts payable, a director of accounts receivable, and so on and so forth until you get down here and you have the, the, the lower level or customer service people, the street level employees that are interfacing with your customers or constituents. So there's this hierarchy. and. What's nice about a hierarchy? Well, lower levels report to higher up levels. And so you have this chain of command. What does that ensure? How does that ensure efficiency? 
Well, not, it means that the president isn't being bothered by everybody, you know, down here at the street level. He's able to, and when we talk about corporate planning, at the corporate level, what are they looking at? What are presidents and CEOs of large corporations looking at? The big picture. Yeah, the big picture, overall goals and directions. Should we merge? Should we acquire another company? What are the goals broadly for the organization for the next five and ten years? And then at the lower functional levels, you get different types of planning. So he said it's a hierarchy. So this is, this is an efficiency because it ensures that he's not thinking about what these people down here are doing. These people at the next level up, the supervisor level, are thinking about what these people are doing. The managers are thinking about what the supervisor is doing. The directors are thinking about what the manager is doing. And the VP are thinking about what the directors are doing. So you've got this efficiency. So information is you know, filtered up and only the really important stuff gets to the top. So you have this hierarchy, this chain of command. You have specialization, that was the next one. And I think that this is something we should think about. One of the things that became popular in the late 1990s and early parts of the two, uh, 2000s of the, the turn of the uh, century or the turn of the millennia was this idea of mergers and acquisitions. And a lot of companies merged. Hewlett Packard bought another big company under Carly Fiorina. I, I just loved how she said she was going to be a great president because she had been a CEO. She was a failed CEO. She practically destroyed Hewlett Packard. She was a horrible, horrible manager. Yeah. You know what to do, Carly? Yeah, you didn't prove it at HP. Sorry. So, specialization. Neighbor says they should be highly specialized. And companies, for the most part, should be highly specialized. And when we talk about branding and this idea of the hierarchy of brands, you should think about this. Does it make sense to merge, to acquire things? Should you engage in other businesses? One of the things that we will tell you is the closest thing you will get to free lunch and finance is what? What is the closest thing you'll get to a free lunch and finance? From your finance class, this should come tripping off your tongue. If it doesn't, I need to go talk to your finance professors. Diversification of your portfolio is a priori a good thing. Why? Why is portfolio diversification? You all are business students. This should come like right out. Why is diversification of your portfolio a good thing? Yeah, why don't you want all of your eggs in one basket? Because if something, if all of your eggs are in oil and gas, then... Yeah, what's um, happened to everybody who had all of their stock in Chesapeake? They don't have any money. Ah, they, they may not have any money when, all, when it's all said and done. When Chesapeake becomes our own little Enron, right here in Oklahoma, you might be left holding the bag. So diversification minimizes microeconomic risk. It doesn't necessarily minimize macroeconomic risk because if the entire stock market crashes, well, yes. we have a problem, but it, it minimizes microeconomic risk. That's not true. Diversification is not necessarily a good thing for businesses. And the reason is because they may not have the ability to manage. One of the things that maybe Carly didn't understand when she became president of Hewlett Packard was what kind of business it is. The fact that you're a, a good executive at one place doesn't necessarily mean you'll be a good executive at other places. They're highly specialized when you get into industry. The fact that you ran a hospital well does not mean that you'll necessarily run a car plant very well. And so they should be highly specialized. And then finally, he says the third characteristic is that they are rule bound. There are rules. And so when you get into organizations, large organizations, they'll have a handbook that'll give you all the rules. They'll have sales manuals that will tell you how to go out and sell and what they want you to do, things like that. Standard operating procedures. Now, in the more modern context, what we recognize is that this is all good, but it can lead to the dehumanization of employees 
and employee morale. And so it's no longer, and one of the things that they recognize in HR is that yes, nobody is irreplaceable. You can replace anybody, but the issue becomes at what cost can you replace people? The more senior executive you get, the more cost it's going to incur on the part of the company to replace people. So maybe what we should do is we should start thinking about how we recruit and retain people. And that's where marketing can play a big role. How are we going to recruit and retain people? And when Chesapeake was run by Aubrey, he did want to become one of the best places to work. One of the things that you'll see companies promoting, and one of the things that we promote here at UCO, we have won, uh, according to USD's World Report, several years in a row, one of the best campuses, one of the best colleges in America to work for. And why is that? Well, because we have a really pretty good environment for our employees here, and they do a lot to promote development. And so we want to do that. So this involves branding and selling to your internal constituents. So what is a brand? So what we're going to do, and the reason I said that this is like the artistic part and the fine art or the, the liberal arts of the business colleges, we're going to have to integrate this idea of the meaning and value of work with this concept of branding and living the brand. So what is a brand? You all know what brands are. What are brands? What is a brand? It's what? Okay. Right, so the Nike swoosh is a brand. It's how people recognize your company. It's how people recognize your company. So a brand is a name. What else can a brand be? It can be a symbol. So for Nike, part of their brand is their symbol, the swoosh symbol. What else is a brand? So a brand can be a name. It can be a symbol or a design. What else can be a brand? A slogan can be a brand. That would be a term. So the definition of a brand is that a brand is a name, sign, symbol, or design that identify the goods or services of a seller. Coca-Cola has not just a brand in Coca-Cola, they also have a brand in what? And this is protected under something called trademark. So, turn this back on. One of the experiments I used to do in my Principles of Marketing class was I would blindfold somebody and I would have them reach into a bag and take out a bottle and tell me what it was. And they could always identify the bottle because Coca-Cola has a what? That's a very distinctive bottle. That's protected as trade dress. So it can also be the packaging can be part of the brand. And Coca-Cola has that. They have protected their brand with trade dress. This is all one type of intellectual property, and you can actually get protection for it. How do you get protection for the brand? Well, you file for a trademark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and you can search to see if your trademark is available. Search trademarks. This is one that I did.
Um, this is one of the brands that I actually filed. That was my law partner, Jerry Dunlap, for the American Education Corporation. So it's a name and a symbol. What do brands do for you? What does branding do for you? Why should you have a brand? What? Provides information shortcuts for consumers. If I say the names of certain things, automatically images pop into your head with what that brand means and its association. So if I said Coca Cola, what do you think of? Do you think of what? Red. red. That's part of their trademark, is the red. What else do you think of? Coca Cola. You think about the polar bears and their great commercials that they have. What else? Beverage. How about mixer? If I say McDonald's. Gross. What? Gross. Gross? You don't eat McDonald's at all? <laughs> Not even their french fries? McDonald's french fries are like bombs. <laughs> They're the best. I saw a video on uh, some website the other day. And it was, they poured uh, uh, melted copper on a McDonald's burger and then it just bounced off. It didn't affect the pattern at all. Really? Yeah. So just take a look. Uh huh. <laughs> Okay. So you think of McDonald's, you think of processed foods. That's one of the reasons that they're successful. They have 80% of the market share in the fast food industry. So most people, it's cheap, convenient, fast, consistent. That's what, I don't know if McDonald's is closing some other stores. That would, that would be remarkable if they are. Walmart is closing a whole bunch of stores. Really they decided to reopen them now? No, a bunch of them are not reopening. Well, Particularly well, in the smaller communities that I they are to. Those express stores that they tried to do in the yeah. Yeah. they're primarily closing. They, uh, they did this in Luther, I think I told you all this before. They bought a, a beloved soccer field in Luther and uh, used it to build their Walmart, which has been there nine months and they're now closing it. And they didn't buy a new soccer field. They were supposed to have a new soccer field in the community. So you get this heuristic in your mind with regard to the company. It provides a shortcut, an information shortcut. So brands are enormously powerful in the minds of consumers, particularly if you have a good brand, like McDonald's. The most valuable brand in the world, at least uh, this year, I think it's still Coca-Cola. They lost out one year to Apple in terms of being the most valuable brand, but Coca-Cola is by, by far one of the most iconic brands in the world. And so branding can lead to positive gains. It provides information for the consumer, and it's an important uh, source of company um, pride and revenue provides that connection in the mind of the consumer and it distinguishes your product and services from other sellers in the marketplace. Positive brand images lead to overall good performance and it's an important aspect of marketing so much so that brand scholars say and argue, and I think that this is indicative of people in their solipsism of their discipline, they argue that it is the most important decision a business can make, is the branding of the business. Now, I have a tendency to say that's not true. Kevin Lane Keller argues that branding is the most important decision a company will make. I've seen lots of companies when I was a, an attorney in private practice that I took through bankruptcy that had great brands, that had great images and logos and really crappy services or products and went broke. So I don't know that it's 
the most important, but it's certainly a big and important decision. And it's certainly for companies like Coca-Cola. Yes. Do you have to renew trademarks? Huh? Do you have to renew trademarks? Do you have to review trademarks? Renew. You do not have to renew because trademarks. Like on, your, on that one it says dead, and other ones yeah. said live. They, they abandoned this trademark, the company that I filed this for, merged into another company, and they abandoned this product line. Okay. And so they decided not to pursue it. You can lose a trademark if the trademark becomes generic. What you want to be is on the, pri uh, on the principal register. And let me see. I think that our other trademarks are still live. They still actually sell this product, I'm surprised, but they merged it into Fuel Dad, which I think I talked to you about before. We were bought out by K12, and K12 rebranded, and they now started selling it as Fuel Dad because they got kind of a bad reputation. But you can lose a brand, uh, you can lose a trademark if it becomes generic. The seminal case on losing a brand is the Murphy Bed, where they decided that the Murphy Bed was actually generic for this, a generic term for this bed that folds up and comes out of the wall. They're enormously popular in small living spaces. And IKEA actually still manufactures some Murphy beds for their, like, have you gone to the IKEA and seen, like, living in 750 square feet? They actually have these beds that will fold down out of the wall so that you can use your living room if you live in a studio in New York City as, you know, your bedroom and dining room and whatever. Um, Murphy bed, the court said, had become generic. So that's the reason that Coca-Cola will go around. And I think I told you this before, they actually police their brands. They go around and if you don't say, if you say I want a Coke and they say, or they give you a Pepsi product, uh, Coca-Cola will actually sue them because they enforce that. They do not want Coca-Cola to become generic or what? Cap carbonated caramelized beverage. They want you to, to know that it is a Coke. So they police it. So you can lose it by it becoming generic. You can abandon it um, and that's one way you lose it. But trademarks, unlike other forms of intellectual property, which extinguish copyright, extinguishes after a term of years, which is the life of the author plus 70, or if it's a corporate work, I think it's 125 or 150 years now. And then patent is the other major form of intellectual property, and that extinguishes after uh, a certain number of years after the filing date of the patent. And so you get patent for, it depends, it's not a set number of years because it's based on the date of filing, and they have to do a patent search to see if they'll actually issue the patent. The trademark is different in that we protect it for as long as you continue to put product out in the marketplace. So Coca-Cola, as long as they stay in business, putting product out in the marketplace, they will have lifetime protection of their, of their trademark. You can trademark anything as long as it's not generic. You can even trademark generic. Coca-Cola actually started out as what we might consider a generic brand because it was a descriptive brand of the name. I mean, it is basically what it says. It was a cocaine. Uh, it started out being made with coca, with coca, which is cocaine, and cola, which is a carbonated, you know, syrupy beverage. And so it was kind of a generic name. But it's acquired secondary meaning in the mind of the consumer. And it no longer is a purely descriptive brand because it's no longer made with cocaine. But initially it was. So you can, you can get trademarked on anything that's not generic or descriptive. If, if you have secondary meaning, you can get it. Um, if it's acquired secondary meaning in the mind of the consumer. You want to be on the principal register. That's what uh, this is. The test search searches for the principal register. And that gets you the highest level of trademark protection. So Turley and Moore have suggested that there are a number of things that lead to good brands. There are a number of elements that are important, and you should know this for the second exam, because it's a test question. 
what makes a good brand? And we're going to integrate this with how you go about living the brand in a minute as an employee. What makes a good brand? Well, they say it should be short. Think of the great brands. Usually one word. Coca-Cola is two. They also have a brand, and there's a shortened form of it, which is just what? Coke. Give me a Coke. One word. Dell. McDonald's, which is the second characteristic. It should be easy to spell. Think of the great brands. They're short, easy to spell. Coke. Nike. Apple. Apple. Easy to remember. It's easy to remember Apple, isn't it? It's easy to remember Nike. Shoes. They should be distinctive. When you see the swoosh, you know Nike. It's very distinctive. When you see the apple symbol with the bite out of the apple, it's very distinctive. Associate that. What do you associate with McDonald's? The arches. The, arches, the golden arches. What about let's see, McDonald's, Nike, Apple? What about Dell? The um, stylized D. Part of their as part of their brand. And finally, it should not carry any negative associations. Now this one is difficult. It should not carry any negative associations. What makes this difficult? Okay, that could be a negative association, particularly in a day. I think I don't think most people even know that anymore, but that's what it started out as. There's a sign in Guthrie on one of the buildings that is an old billboard, basically, for Coca-Cola. And it says, Coca-Cola, the relaxing beverage. It was relaxing because it contained cocaine. These runners in South America, there's this tribe of runners that run for enormous distances. And the entire time they'll chew on a leaf from the coca plant. And they hypothesize that that may help with, you know, the reason that they don't get fatigue or, or pain. That's a very, it's not like cocaine, the drug, because it's a pure form and it's a highly, you know, diluted. It's not highly concentrated like when it's processed, but it apparently has some of those inhibitory effects in terms of pain management. So that could become, if people still associated it with that, that could become a negative association. What's happening with sports teams and their brand? Washington Redskins. The Redskins. Was that, when they developed that brand, do you think people had a lot of negative association with it? No. Do they now? What are the Native American populations saying? They want them to change their brand. They've actually lost the trademark. That's another way you can lose trademark, is if the brand becomes offensive, you can lose trademark. If it's a patently offensive brand, you can lose it. Is that a patently, was that at the time they came up with the brand, was it offensive to most people? No, but it certainly becomes so. Lots of sports teams have rebranded themselves because they used what were maybe offensive racial stereotypes at the time that, at the time they were not racially offensive, or they, I think they probably still were, but people were less sensitive to that, and so they've, uh, they've actually lost trademark. Oklahoma City University used to be the Oklahoma City Chiefs, and their brand image for their team was 
uh, Native American with a full sort of, you know, headdress, and lots of teams have abandoned that, so Oklahoma City became the what? The Stars, the Oklahoma City Stars. NSU did the same thing. Yeah, the interesting thing is that the uh, Florida State mascot is what? The Seminoles, and they haven't rebranded that, why? I think it's not really... Like they actually have an agreement with the Seminole Nation of Florida to use that as their brand, as their mascot. And they haven't had nearly, because they've had the approval of the tribe, they haven't had nearly the blowback that the Washington Redskins have experienced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My high school, uh, we were at Iowa's, and back when the whole Washington Redskins had started going up, uh, the leader of the Iowa tribe was uh, Oklahoma actually came into our town because we were just right across the border in Texas and wanted to like start paperwork and whatever to uh, keep us uh, from having to change our names. He wanted like our football team and baseball team and everything to carry the Kiowa name because we were like up and coming and everything. He thought, they thought it was really cool that we were like honoring them or whatever. That you were honoring the tribe? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think you can make that argument. The Redskins have had a lot of a lot of trouble. Florida did, I think, a good job because they managed it with the Seminole tribe. And I think if you look at the Seminole uh, mascot for FSU, you could argue that it's equally as sort of stereotypically indicative as the Washington Redskin mascot. I feel like the Redskins is talking about every Native American tribe, not just one single like the Seminoles or the Kiowas. They're talking about every tribe, so right. they can't. I mean, they could, I guess, but they're not going to get the approval for every single Native American tribe in the United States to keep that name. So, the um, other thing that's kind of interesting about the Florida is that I wonder if the Oklahoma Seminoles started making it that if it would have an impact on them, because you know there are two Seminole tribes in the United States. They're both related. They both started out in Florida. There was half of the tribe that stayed in Florida when they when they tried to round them up. They retreated to the Everglades and stayed there. That tribe is the Florida Seminoles, and then the part that were removed from Florida that they got rounded up to Oklahoma became the Oklahoma Seminoles, which are one of the five what we call civilized tribes in Oklahoma. What are the civilized tribes? There are four C's and an S: Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw. And I wonder if the Oklahoma Seminoles started throwing a fit if they would change their position. The Florida Seminoles are an enormously wealthy tribe. Do you know what they own? Do so you know what they own? They own Hard Rock. They own Hard Rock. And all of the licensing that goes along with Hard Rock. So they're an enormously powerful and enormously wealthy tribe. Our, our Seminoles wish they were as wealthy as they are. We have one tribe that's done um, equally as well as the Florida Seminoles. What is that? That's the Chickasaw. Chickasaw National Industries. C and I are. Yeah, they're the ones that do the videos. They own the largest casino in the world, which is down on the Oklahoma Texas border. They've been past it. It looks like a city. Yeah, it's it's incredible. And that casino started out when I was in high school or maybe college. It started out as a butler building, just like a lot of the others. And part of it is still those tent buildings that they put a facade over. And you can kind of tell when you go in. They compete for the largest casino in the world with a casino I think that's in Thailand. And every time they get bigger, the, you'll see them out there building on to the, uh, the casino in the south part of uh, Oklahoma. They also own Riverwind, which is the one that's just south of Norman. Um, the one that's down on the border is called Windstar. So they've become just as, as politically powerful and as wealthy as the Seminoles in their ability to, to control that. It was interesting at Acme, we had one of the Chickasaw Nation industry marketers come and talk, and she said, we don't use the term branding 
with regard to our people because it has a negative connotation. Where does the term branding actually come from? Well, you brand cattle, and she said you don't brand the people, and so they talked about how they produced images of their tribe, not branding, which I thought was kind of interesting. So it shouldn't carry any negative associations. This, of course, as I was pointing out, can become problematic as things get the negative connotation. One of the things that we did with this one, our stylized mark with the advanced learning system was a big red letter A with a plus, A plus learning systems. Could that become a negative connotation with regard to your generation, for example? One of the things when I first started teaching 20 years ago, that they told us, I took an education course, and they told us that your generation didn't like red, that you had a fear of red, <laughs> that you wouldn't read red comments. We should grade, the people in the College of Ed that I took the classroom told me I should grade in friendly green, <laughs> green, because students have this aversion to red. So that's something that could carry a negative connotation. There are different types of brands. Truly and Moore come up with a typology of brands that you should know. There are descriptive brands. Coca-Cola starts out as a descriptive brand, gets a trademark because it requires secondary meaning in the mind of the consumer. What's nice about descriptive brands? Well, they tell you what it is. They describe the product. They don't get very high protection on the register. There's nothing that associates, is there anything that is associated with an Apple and a computer? No. So that's a completely arbitrary or fanciful brand, and that gets the highest level of protection. There are person-based brands. Dell is actually a person-based brand. What is Dell? Who started Dell? Michael Dell. He's the founder of Dell, computer. So it's a person-based brand. Tyson is a person-based brand. Walmart is partly a person-based brand in that it was the, it's a shortened version of Walton, which was the founder. Sam's is a person-based brand. What is the image that comes to mind with Walmart? That's what I was going to ask. It used to be a smiley face, now it's that stupid symbol that I can't figure out what the hell it is. It's a spark. It's some stupid acronym that the people at home office came up with. Really? It's that it's yellow be, thing? It's supposed to be a spark. Um, oh, the lines around. Lines. I don't remember that. Okay. It looks like, like an alien crop circle thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, when, that, when they started using that, I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> you could associate the smiley face. It used to be blue vests. Associated with Walmart. Associated brands, that's another type of branding. So descriptive bands, person-based person brands, associated brands. What's an associated brand? When I was growing up, there were lots of these around. There are not so many anymore. You can still go to small Oklahoma towns and find them. There were all of these grocery stores called IGA. It was IGA a big corporate, like Walmart? No. IGA stood for what? International Groceries Association. It was a co-op of stores. And what did they do as this co-op? So it's an associative brand. What were they doing? Well, the association, because it was a collective of independent, I'm not sorry, not international, it was independent groceries association, independent retailers, independent grocers could buy in larger quantities and get the volume discounts. So that's an associated brand. Geographic reference brands. So what's a geographic reference brand? What's a geographic reference? You're wearing one. The Oklahoma City Thunder. Where the team's located. Yeah. 
What's a geographic reference? What else could be a geographic reference? And these can overlap. Champagne, technically, if you get sparkling, and in Europe, they're very sticky on this. They're, they're very uh, insistent. They, they really protect their brands. Champagne is actually an associated brand. It comes from, real champagne has to come from where? To be called champagne. champagne. If it comes from California and other places, it really cannot be labeled champagne if you sell it in Europe because they say it's got to come from where? Champagne. It's got to come from the Champagne region of France. So that's a geographic reference brand. And then there are alphanumeric brands. I think there's also another type that I had that I wrote a paper on that said we ought to in include in the typology a theme-based brand. What's a theme-based brand? We have one here in Oklahoma City. You can think of fairly easily out on I-35. Frontier City. That's a theme-based brand based on our Western sort of heritage, which lasted for all of about 25 seconds in 1889s to about 1902. And then it was open. It didn't even last that long, probably. But it's that idea that we're a Western rugged state, so that's a theme-based branding. My own business, the Haunted Stone Line Inn, use a theme base. And you can have overlap between these, so you'll a lot of times find, for example, in banking, First National Bank of Guthrie, that's an alphanumeric and geographic reference brand overlapped. More importantly, and with regard to what we're talking about with this idea of meaning and value of work and how companies can harness this, is once you develop these brands, you have to manage them. How do you manage a brand? Well, you have to, according to Kevin Lane Keller, you have to continually deliver benefits that customers truly desire. What's one way you do that? Well, it's continuous improvement. And let's think about this. So I came back from New Orleans. I had to fly on, because I had two female students that went with me, my mom went with me to New Orleans because I don't want to be the only you know, male with two female students, so she agreed to go. We got her ticket after the school had purchased ours, and so she got to fly on Southwest. Ours were purchased through Central Purchasing, and we got to fly in America. I hate American Airlines. They're mean at the counter. If you don't show up, I can tell you, I've shown up, I was at 58 minutes before departure one time, I was flying an American, and I tried, and they're like, we're not checking that bag. You, you, you're just gonna have to carry it on. You didn't get here an hour and a half before, we're not checking it. I've shown up 30 minutes before a Southwest flight, and they're like, your bag may not make it on this one, but we'll get it to you. Big difference. What is it that customers, for those of you who have flown, how many of you have flown Southwest? How many of you like Southwest? What do you like about Southwest? They're just friendly. They are friendly. They like their jobs, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, the people on American, the, the flight attendants on the flight were bitchy and horrible. They didn't seem to be enjoying their job. American makes a joke half the time out of the pre-flight. Like, who the hell doesn't know how to fasten a seatbelt in this day and age? So they, you know, I've been on flights where the flight attendant is buckling it around their head to show you how to fasten your seatbelt low and tight. The last uh, Southwest flight I was on, she said, you need to buckle it low and tight across those skinny little hips of yours. 
I, they just seem to be having a good time. They throw, you know, stuff at you and pitch it, you know, like, this is a quick flight, we're gonna pitch the food, and they start handing out from these baskets and kind of, you know, duck so that we don't hit you. They're just having a good time. So you deliver benefits that customers truly desire. What is it that we really like about Southwest? For those of you who fly, they're fun, they're cheap, you get to sit where you want. It's kind of a cattle call, but it's open seating, so you can, you know, if you want to sit closer to the restrooms, you can, things like that. I mean, it's, it's just that kind of thing. So in managing the brand, they have consistently <coughs> trained their people on how to engage the customers with this benefit that they truly desire. That's a good place to stop since I'm running out of time. We'll pick up here. It's colder in here. Yeah, I was the only one that was in the whole group of four years last. I don't know if you knew where you were. I think he shows up in the whole bunch. Tonight, I did basketball. Anybody else need to sign us?